episode 766, Five Tips for Digital Portfolios. Today's episode is sponsored by Tract, a fantastic new project-based peer-to-peer learning platform that you can pilot free now. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn how. Welcome to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast, hosted by author, educator, speaker, and mom, the cool cat teacher, Vicki Davis. So today we're talking with Tisha Poncio, 21-year veteran educator, about five tips for digital portfolios. So Tisha, let's start off talking about what ages and time spans for portfolios. So I have worked with students in the secondary classroom for portfolios. That's actually where I started my teaching journey, but I've also been a digital coach K through 12, and I have worked with teachers and encouraged teachers and worked with the little learners as well to implement digital portfolios. I think the overall goal here, Vicki, is to make the learning stick. And when you can teach the students to document, to curate and to make choices, critically think through their work and what is their best work to showcase, I think it's just really powerful because it's a lifetime skill. You and I as adults have our portfolios. We're still using those. And I just think it's a skill that every student needs, especially because we're raising leaders. Excellent. So what's your first tip? So my first tip is to plan now. Teachers need to be planning now. Decide if you want that digital portfolio to span over the scope of a year or if you just want it to be specifically for a grading period. Also think about, do you want students to curate everything they're doing for every class or do you want them to focus on writing or literacy or language? It's really up to you. I always say there is a way, not the way. So there is not a wrong way to do this in your classroom. I think the goal is to give and gift your students this opportunity to critically think through curating their work because curation is a huge skill for them as well in that digital citizenship age that they're in. For sure. Okay. So we do want to mention that you've recently gone to work for Wakelet, but we are pulling in your very recent classroom experience with using portfolios. So we want to plan now. We want to talk about, you know, what's the portfolio going to look like? I know I have my students build a website in eighth grade on Google sites and then move that up. So is this something that can hand off from year to year? Yes. And I will tell you, I'm going to go ahead and plug it now because if I was still in the classroom, I would be equally as excited about this. But Wakelet has a new feature for safe and secure student accounts. That means that any student under 13 now can utilize the power of Wakelet and curate their information, create profiles, and the teachers can moderate that. So a lot of times I taught, that's one of my tips actually, is give students the choice for what they use. My students in the classroom used Google sites. They've tried WordPress. They've tried Blocker. They've tried everything. The interesting thing is my students kept coming back to Wakelet. And that is really when I, as their educator, took note, like, what are they, why are they going back to this? Because I kind of left it open-ended for those high schoolers. But the safe and secure accounts is going to make it to where those teachers can really moderate. And that is one of my highest priorities as an educator, but also as a digital learning specialist. So you give them a choice about what to use for their portfolio. But when you say moderate, that means that they suggest what they want to approve. And before it goes live, you get to approve it. Yeah. And you don't even have to make it go live. It can be with these Wakelet student accounts. Teachers can import those from their Google Classroom, from Clever, from Microsoft. And you have your students in this space together and they can only see each other's stuff. It isn't public. You never have to make it public, but the great thing about it is I did this with my students. I downloaded their profiles or collections as a PDF, and I put them in an email, a Gmail account, and I sent it off to the parents because the parents don't have to have accounts to view their students' work. Mm -hmm. And for a parent, busy parent who doesn't want to mess with any of that, they just want to check their email from their teacher. It just worked really well to showcase those items. And the parents are equally blown away by their students' work. It happened every year. And I had a couple of students now that have graduated, Vicki, but they are using their portfolio Wakelet accounts for their small businesses. Some of them haven't even graduated high school. So how cool is that? So our first is plan now. Our second is give students the choice Choice. Mm -hmm. of what to use. Okay, what's your third? 
model. It's really important for you as the educator to model what it looks like. So put together and curate some of your work to show them what it looks like and to remind them that the talents that you have as an educator will not look exactly the same as their portfolio. They're going to have different talents. They're going to have different showcases, different pieces of artwork. Maybe they have YouTube videos of them singing or playing the guitar. I am not putting that on my portfolio because I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to highlight and model that individualization for your students as well. So that is my next tip is to model. And that would go across the board. You're modeling now digital citizenship. You're modeling digital portfolios. You're modeling kind of what meeting those learning standards looks like. You're showcasing, oh, this is my work. I can show my learning now. Mm -hmm. And if I want to go back to it, I can. Excellent. Okay. So we're going to model. What's our fourth? Checkpoints. So I will send you, Vicki, so you can add this to the show notes, but I will send you a rubric for all the listeners. I really encourage teachers to do checkpoints. And again, as a teacher and as an educator of your classroom, you are going to come up with what those checkpoints are. Do you want beginning of year, middle of year, end of year? That's great for those larger checkpoints. You know, you're taking major grades on that, but I would also encourage you to have students show little pieces along the way so that they will get used to doing that in their job in college, right? So it's, again, just teaching them those habits. So that's the next tip is checkpoints. I love that because I do checkpoints. Sometimes I'll have students do screenshots. Sometimes I'll have them do screencasts. Sometimes I'll have them give me a link. And other times I'll have them write a report of, okay, this is my status update. So there's lots of ways to do those checkpoints. Yeah, flip grids, right? Yeah, (laughs) that's something I do too, Tisha. I I cannot stress with project-based learning. I totally agree with you how important it is to do checkpoints. Absolutely. It's interesting because when you do that, you're really allowing your students some time for reflection. And you're also creating this conversation. The student, I did student-led conferences. So there is a conversation then that your student learner is leading. And I just think that's such an important skill. This goes K through 12. Honestly, Vicki, it goes all the way up to adulthood. <laughs> Excellent. Love it. So what's our fifth? Okay, so my fifth and final tip is to share, decide how your students are going to showcase their work because what happens is it becomes much more powerful when they're sharing with a specific audience. Now, that could be just their parents. If you wanted to keep it moderated to just parents or just the principal or just the school community, but I had my students actually showcase publicly and what that did with my high schoolers is I was able to have a conversation with them about digital citizenship, digital literacy, best practices for putting information out into the world, what information you do not want to share on your portfolio or your resume. I do think it's important because when they're doing the work for you, that's one thing. They're expecting you to take a grade on it. They're expecting those checkpoints. When you're sharing it out with someone else, it really just levels up that learning and they they really take more ownership of that. So that is my last and final tip allow them to share with a real world audience. Okay. So as we finish up, I want to ask one more question. A teacher thinks they want to do a portfolio. They want to sit down with their principal, fill in the blank. The best thing about student portfolios is blank. The best thing about student portfolios is the students are seeing their own learning now. They're not just taking the word for the grade. I got a 95. No, they see it. It's together. They have something tangible to take with them when they leave your classroom. Yeah. And you know what I'll add, and you may want to share this. When my students do their portfolios, I have them do a self-grade with a rubric Yes, and turn it in. And if they get within five points of mine, so I don't look at theirs. They don't look at mine. And if we get within five points of each other, I actually give them bonus because of they were accurately understanding. And a lot of times they're a little harder on themselves than I am. (laughs) You are absolutely right about that, Vicki. I did do that. I did a lot of self-grading. It's interesting because they are harder on themselves than I would be. 
I would tell them, give yourself a grade. And then they would have to validate that grade. Mm -hmm. That was a difficult process for them, but it was the most powerful thing because then they were able to self critique their work and also be able to take my critiques and they weren't taking it personally. Also another skill for us to teach our students. So Tisha Poncio, and this is five tips for digital portfolios. Look forward to including the rubric that you would like to share. And we do want to mention that the Wakelet does work, which this is not a advertised for Wakelet or anything, but it does work with lots of other apps, right? It does. There's integrations with Flipgrid, with Google, Adobe Spark. I mean, you uh, essentially, Vicki, you could put anything from the web into Wakelet and it's going to help support that learning. It's also going to help you give out resources to your students. So digital portfolios is a great place to start. And there are schools I would like to mention that in addition to standardized testing are doing portfolios across the board for their whole school. So that is amazing. (laughs) That's excellent. Thank you, Tisha. Thank you so much for having me. Today's episode is sponsored by Tract. Tract will empower your students to develop 21st century ready skills through project-based peer-to-peer learning. For a limited time, you can pilot tracks on-demand project-based classes and clubs free in your classroom. I'm a project-based learning classroom and have joined this pilot. Request free access today at teach.tract.app with the access code coolcatteacher. Again, that's teach.tract.app with the access code coolcatteacher. If you have students aged eight or older, you'll want to bring them into this self-directed project-based platform that will rock your classroom and their world. So go to teach.tract.app and use the access code coolcatteacher. And stay tuned for a review of Tract coming to the Cool Cat Teacher blog soon. Try out Tract today. If you enjoyed today's 10-Minute Teacher podcast, why not subscribe on iTunes? You can also catch up with Vicki on Twitter at Cool Cat Teacher or level up and learn with her blogs and free resources at coolcatteacher.com. Thanks for listening.